So here are some of the questions we want to ask. What the disciples didn't know and Jesus knew is that the Passover would be different from any Passover they had ever had. Totally different. You think, well, it's just marginal. No, it's totally different. Because the focus is not on the sacrificial lamb of the Old Testament. The focus is on the lamb of God, the sacrificial lamb of God, Christ Jesus. So we will find here in this, this Passover that Jesus is talking about, we will find that Jesus will institute the taking of the bread and wine. And what does he tell us about that? Well, I want to give you some references so that it's not just a matter of me saying this, but for us to recognize that Jesus took note of this and Jesus has a statement to make about it. So in Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 and 27, here's what we find Jesus saying in this regard, verse 26 and verse 27 here. He says here, while they were eating, Jesus took bread. Now the Passover, they would eat the Passover meal. Uh, they had certain foods that they would have in that particular evening. But in the midst of this, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to his disciples. One of the things that helps us in communion is to understand when Jesus takes his bread, first of all, he gives thanks. This is a very positive reflection on what Jesus wanted to do for each and every one of us. With Jesus, the, the bread represents the body of Christ. And he was thankful to be able to make that sacrifice on all of our behalf. Because sometimes we may think that it is our sins and our sins alone that kill Jesus. And we fail to realize and appreciate and have gratitude for the fact that Jesus, our Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, decided long before you and I, I ever came along that they would do it. He would make sacrifice. He would lay down his life for us. It is, and when we start thinking it's, it's all about me, it's all about me and my sins, as opposed to it's about Jesus, about his willingness to lay down his life for us, it takes on a different tone and it takes on a different aspect of understanding communion. So he said to his disciples, he broke it, he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, a reminder here, when we talk about the Messiah, when we talk about Christ's coming, it is Jesus came to save sinners. Jesus didn't come to, to, to save, let's say, somebody else. It's important to recognize who we are and what Jesus has come to do. It's to save sinners and to bring us into a relationship with him, a loving relationship and an appreciation. With that thought in mind, when we think about the forgiveness of God, and I've used this example numerous times, and I'll do it one more time, and I hope you're not offended by this. But remember the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears and wiped it with the hair of her head. And Jesus made this statement to her, and again, this is about communion. Communion is the ability to relate to be close to God, to, to allow God's presence to be in our life. This, the, the people around, people who were sinners but didn't see themselves as sinners, the scribes and Pharisees, said, that if you knew what kind of person she was, Lord, you wouldn't let her to touch you or anything like that. 
Jesus knew exactly what kind of person that she was. Because Jesus saw her differently. And but Jesus made some interesting comments. But I want to reflect on this. Because Jesus is the Word of God who became flesh. He became human. He had all the human qualities. He was tempted at all points as we are, and yet without sin. But because of his humanity, because of who he is, and because of his purpose, I'm going to suggest that he saw this woman not like the scribes and Pharisees who saw her as a sinner and somebody that was very untouchable, but rather that his humanity gave him a relationship with this lady that he saw as his sister. He calls us brother, we're called brothers and sisters in Christ. He saw her as his sister. He also recognized something else. And he says to her, and this is important for us to recognize, and this is not in your notes, and you may want to go back and check on this. But he says to this, this lady, he says, your sins, which are many. He acknowledges that she has many sins. And so you and I might acknowledge in the same way, except Jesus' words here, your sins, which are many, are forgiven. And then he makes the, the point that to me is so awesome and beautiful. Go in good cheer. Now, when you think about going in good cheer, and think about Jesus' forgiveness, he didn't say, he didn't put it this way. Well, think about this for a while, and as you go grow older and you process, you're going to be a little happy. When did Jesus intend for her to be happy? He intended for her, as he intends for us, right now, this very moment, as she left there, that she was good, had good cheer. She was celebrating, she was praising God, and she was so absolutely very thankful. And for the first time in her life, what Jesus wanted her to know and understand is, look, sister, there is nothing between you and me. I forgive you of all of your sins. And that changes our relationship with God. So Jesus is the bread and wine. He became one of us. With this, Jesus also goes on to say, Here, this is the blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sin. So we find here Jesus is introducing the beginning of the new covenant. That his blood represented a time of dramatic change in sacrifices. We will also know that Jesus will take the focus from the Passover of the Old Testament sacrificial lamb to the lamb of God. We read earlier in the book of Luke in chapter 22, one of the things that Jesus said when he had the bread and the wine. He said, do all these things, you know, he does not say, do all these things in remembrance of the Passover. He said, rather, do all of these things in remembrance of me. The Lord's Supper, communion, however we, words that we might use, Eucharist is about Christ Jesus and remembering him as the very Lamb of God, which is, of course, what John said. John reminded us in John chapter 1 and verse 29 of this, when he saw Christ coming there toward him, where, where Jesus, John says, the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now another important, it doesn't say, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of just one person or two people. No, he 
He takes away all the sins of the world. Now that changes our relationship not only with God, but also with one another. Because if God takes away the, your sins and also takes away the sins of your neighbor, we function differently and we see one another differently. Jesus also will make it possible to do what people felt was impossible. When we read here, he says, take this bread, it is my body. Take this wine, this is my blood. Jesus makes what is seemingly impossible possible. Now, this is again a point about trusting God and believing God and believing who He is and what He has done and changing our lives as well. Now when I say believing what is impossible, Jesus had told His disciples earlier that we must eat His flesh and drink His blood. And immediately they had an argument with Him. And they had a scriptural basis for arguing. From the Old Testament point of view, you can't eat somebody's flesh. That's totally against the law of God. You can't drink somebody's blood. And so people left Jesus. They departed because this seemingly was impossible for them. So we read in John chapter 6, in verse 53 through 58, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. Now, for us maybe to understand this, we might want to go back to when we were little kids and try to explain it to ourselves or to our kids. Well, you must eat the flesh and you must drink the blood. The little kids, they can't comprehend it. As, as a young kid, when my parents were trying to explain to me, God lives in you, God lives in your heart. It's like, I'm looking, you know, well, where is he? I, I can't comprehend it. Nor could these adult people comprehend eating the flesh of Christ and drinking his blood. Nor could they comprehend that in this they have eternal life. But he says, you must eat my flesh, drink my blood, and he who does has eternal life. And I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whosoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. Coming back to again, what is this about? The bread, the wine, it is in remembrance of Christ, and it is because of him. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna, and they died. But he who feeds on this bread will live forever. So we see here that Jesus shares the impossible. And he makes it possible through bread, physical bread, and physical wine. And we follow that, and we believe in faith because of what he has said. And we do this because of that. Jesus will share the true bread from heaven that we might live. Now Jesus also, though, makes the Passover personal. It is very, it's somewhat impersonal when you go out and you gather a lamb without blemish in the Old Testament of Israel and you sacrifice that lamb and you may feel rather poorly about it, but this is what you're to do. Jesus makes the Passover personal because he is the Lamb of God. That's why I started at the beginning of the sermon saying, when Jesus said, with desire, I have desired to eat this Passover. He did not say, I have desired to eat the Passover, this Passover. This one's different in so many ways. This is a different one. This is the one that is not a shadow of things to come. It is not just passing over sin. 
This one is the reality of the love of God who sent His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe on Him should have everlasting life. The Passover, this Passover, the real Lamb of God places Himself on the altar of sacrifice. It is His body and His blood that removes sin from our lives forever. Not just a Passover that is, in essence, good for the moment, but you've got to do it 364 days later. He isn't passing over our sins. He's removing it as far as east is from west. He is cleansing our conscience so that we can sit down with Jesus, looking in the eye, and know that He has nothing against us. It is this body and blood that removes sin from our lives forever. It is the reality of that, not repeated again and again. So with that thought in mind, I just want to refer quickly to Hebrews chapter 10. Because the author of Hebrews is dealing with this shadow that sometimes people have allowed themselves to stay in the shadow and not moving forward. And sometimes it's the thinking that from the Old Testament that where God says, I change not. And God doesn't change, but that doesn't mean that things don't change in our humanity. There are so many things that God changes, but God is always law. God has always had His purpose. So this is reference to the law. The law, this is Hebrews 10, verse 1. The law is only a shadow of good things that are coming, not the reality themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifice and repeated endlessly after year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, they would not have stopped being offered, for the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and no longer have felt guilty for their sins. And that is a problem in our humanity and communion. It's a difficulty for us as human beings to accept the fullness of the forgiveness of Christ Jesus. It is very difficult. We think about on the night Jesus was betrayed and Peter denied him three times. When Jesus looked at him the next morning, Jesus gave him what I like to call the look of love which absolutely devastated the heart of Peter. He didn't give him the look of, you scoundrel, you sinner. No, it was a look of love. I hope that we can see that. And we can recognize that we no longer feel guilty, that God removes our guilt. And God, because of the perfect sacrifices. Then verse 3, but those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you do not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you're not pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O oh God. Here I am. Jesus offered himself willingly. I want to jump all the way down here, which I read earlier. Well, I read this in essence earlier in chapter 10, where it says in verse 11, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But when this priest, speaking of Christ, had offered for, for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to make him his footstool, because by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made whole. And verse 15, we need some help in, in understanding and appreciating this. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. 
First he says, this is the covenant I will make with them. I will put my law in their heart, I will write them in their minds. So Christ was once offered once and for all. Now I want to make another point which is unique to this year and to our situation. And that is that Jesus knows social isolation. Jesus knows social isolation because on the day in which he was crucified, he was at least six feet separated from all humanity as he hung on the cross. Never had Jesus, though, been so close to mankind as in the moment that he gave his life for us. Now let's stop and think about that. Never in the history of mankind had he been so close. Jesus was drawing us to him. Now, feeling isolated? Yes. At the same time drawing us close, Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. Communion is being made possible. In fact, Jesus prophesied this in John chapter 12, verses 32 and 33, where Jesus makes this statement here in verse 32. He says here, But when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. That when he was lifted up, he would draw all men to himself. I think, brethren, in that particular moment, as Jesus makes himself so close to us, and yet so far, and not being able to reach out and touch him, as it were, if we reached out, if we could reach out in that particular moment, that particular time and touched Jesus on the cross the feeling of his love for you and for me and communion with him would never be the same never if we could reach out across that expanse and let's call it six feet because that's what we talk about and touch Jesus in that particular moment when he was giving our life for us. He was laying down his life and pouring out his love and pouring out his life in the blood and in the pain and the agony. We would never feel so close because of what he was doing for each and every one of us. And at that moment, in time, I think we could truly say that we've tasted of the true bread from heaven. We would never say, Lord, give us that manna that came down in the wilderness. Rather, we would say, how awesome is the bread of life. It has given me life. Jesus was isolated. And Jesus made this statement, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet we have promises from God as in Hebrews 13, where God says, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. Jesus also tells us in John 14 that he would send another comforter. This is like verses 19 through 23. And he says, you know, the Holy Spirit will come into our life. God will dwell on us. God with us. He will come and he says, if you keep my commandments, if you, if you have this relationship with me, the things that I teach you, the things that I tell you, then I will come and I will make my abode with you. And my Father will make his abode with you. You will dwell in me and I will dwell in you and my Father will dwell in us. And the end result is, that we will be one. Because Jesus' prayer in John 17 is, Father, may they be one as we are one. Jesus' prayer and reminder is, Father, I have loved them 
as you have loved me. So when we go back now to check Luke chapter 22 and verses 19 and 20, here's what we read again, and this is what we focus on. Luke chapter 22 now and verse 19. Where Jesus took the bread, he gave thanks and broke and gave to them, saying, This is my body given to you. Again, do this in remembrance of me. Again, brethren, in this moment in time, Jesus and you are one on one. We have to remember that sometimes, even in the biggest crowd, it's one on one. In this moment, in the moment of communion, it is one on one. We are in God's sight. He shed his blood, blood for us. We must think, Lord Jesus, you shed your blood for me, and you did it willingly because you love me. And Jesus goes on to say here in John and Luke, rather, is this. He says, do this in remembrance of me. So I'm not trying to overdo this or over-dramatize this at all. Jesus did not say, do this in remembrance of the Passover. Do this in remembrance of me. Now what is important about this, brother, is that we understand what is our perspective and what is our view of Jesus. If we do not see Jesus for who he really is, if we do not see Jesus for God in the flesh who loved us and gave his life for us, and we have a, a jaded perspective of Jesus that he's out to get you and he's just looking to you know for your sin. No, Jesus is out to love you. Jesus is out to help you and me to understand that we are fully forgiven. Jesus is out there with his arms wide open on the cross saying, come to me. Because again, his statement was, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to me. I hope that we can sit down in good cheer in the presence of God and that our focus, because the reality of our focus, brethren, that all of this is on Jesus, our focus. It is not on the Old Testament Passover. It is not on the Old Testament Lamb. Every communion is about Jesus and the relationship made possible in the sacraments of the bread and wine. The Lord's Supper, communion, is about Jesus, his loving sacrifice for all men and God. We are we need to know that we have an official invitation in Christ Jesus. Not only do we have an invitation, we have a relationship. It's like being invited to a party if you feel like you're, you're not welcome, you feel like they got something against you, you got problems and all, all of these things and they never care about you, then you just don't feel the joy of being there at that moment. But with Jesus' invitation to all of us, all of us who are sinners, all of us who are brothers and sisters in Christ, is to come, all you who are weak and weary, and I will give you rest. Communion with Jesus Christ gives us a rest that we can only, in some ways, rejoice in and imagine. But I hope that you've got enough of the love of God and not only do you think about it, you understand it cognitively, but you also feel through the presence of His Holy Spirit that rest and that peace. And I say through the presence of the Holy Spirit because I'm reminded of what the Apostle Paul says in the book of Romans. It says, when our spirit unites with God's spirit, we cry, Abba, Father. I pray today, as we come to the Lord's table and communion, that we also feel His presence in our life, accept His love, accept His forgiveness, and enjoy the relationship that is made possible by Christ Jesus 
enjoy eternal life because we have life in Christ through the bread and the wine and the sacrifice of Christ. So this time, we want to come to the Lord's table. I want to invite you all into the presence of Jesus. And I hope that you can say to the Lord as well, here I am, Lord. Thank you. Love you. So I'm about to ask the blessing upon the elements. So, bread and the wine, and then we can take this together. So if you're joining with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, thank you very much for your Son, who is the exact representation of you, our Lord, our Creator, the loving sacrifice, the Lamb of God, as John said, who came to lay down his life for us so that we might have life and we might have it more abundantly. Father, as we prepare to take this bread, we recognize that this bread represents the body of Christ, that it was broken for us. He did it voluntarily. He knows what humanity is all about. And so we're reminded in the book of Hebrews again, come boldly before the throne of grace in a time of need. That's what we can do. Because we have a high priest who is tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. So as we prepare to take this bed, let us remind, be reminded of that. And then as we also prepare to take this wine, we ask your blessing upon it as well, which cleanses us from a couple of sins. No, it cleanses us from all sins. It purifies our conscience. It gives us a desire to live with Christ, to have the mind of Christ, and to have life, so that we might serve you with all of our being to your glory and your praise. We thank you for all of this, and we ask your blessing upon the bread and the wine, and we give you thanks for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I raise this bread, the body of Christ, Lord, live in us, and thank you so much. And as Jesus said to the woman, your sins which are many are forgiven. Come in good cheer. May the blood of Christ cleanse our conscience from all sin. And may we live in his presence to be glory. To the blood of Christ. Amen. Thank you for coming to the Lord's table. Let's end in prayer. Father, Thank you so very much for your son. Help us to live life. Help us to understand what Jesus said. And so that come you might have life, and you may have it more abundantly. May you be glorified in your life. May we live in communion with you, our daily bread, day in and day out. And as often as we take this, do this. In remembrance of our Lord and Savior Jesus, and in His name we do pray and give you thanks. Amen. Amen. The world today is a challenging environment for Christian believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Looking for answers? Grace Communion International local churches in Fairfield, Santa Rosa, and Modesto offers a comforting environment for Christians in search of spiritual growth and development. Contact a local ministry. Attend their local GCI churches at the times listed on your screen.